So good morning. Welcome to this uh, last seminar this year. And uh, today uh, we will have the talk by Dr. Renato Dubke by, from the Observatorio Nacional. He will talk about uh, fossil groups of galaxies seeing the future looking at the past. So uh, he holds a bachelor degree in astronomy from the Lomonosov Moscow State University in 1990s, and then a degree in physics and mathematics from the, uh, again, from Lomonosov Moscow State University in 93, and uh, a, PhD, a PhD degree. He was a research fellow in the de Department of Astronomy at the University of Michigan in the High Energy Group from 1999 uh, to 2003 when he became an assistant research scientist in the same department until 2009. He's currently a full research at the National uh, Observatory. He has experience in astronomy with emphasis on high energy astrophysics, where he worked on data reduction and analysis of satellites like Einstein, Rosat, ASCA, uh, BIPOSACS, Chandra, XMM Newton. Um, he is the principal investigation investigator of the uh, JPAS, the Havalambra Physics uh, of the Accelerating Universe Survey in Brazil, uh, and uh, scientific director of the collaboration. He works in the area of extragalactic astro astrophysics with a current focus on large scale uh, structures, galaxy clusters, groups, fossil clusters, metal enrichment, and dynamics of the intracluster medium supercluster and cosmic filaments, supernova explosion models. So uh, thank you very much, Renato, for this uh, last seminar today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Am I okay? Uh, in any case, oh. So uh, before I start, I'd like to ask you something, because uh, 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 probably some of you heard that I I got some virus last week, in well there, and uh, so it was an unusual virus. Even though I was tested for COVID many times, it was negative. So I ended up going to meet visit Terrell's hospital. And before I went there, the, some lady, the, 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 you know, the cooking lady there said that, uh, oh, this is not COVID, this is a virus that everybody's getting. And I was, well, okay, thank you, doctor, cooking lady. So I went to the hospital and the doctor there basically said the same thing. So uh, in principle, I got some virus that everybody's getting. And I'm just showing that, uh, and have been testing anyway, every day, just in case. And if you don't mind, I will, uh, Take my mask out. This is 100%. Everybody's comfortable with that. Are you too? Okay. You may just get the virus that everybody gets. So <laughs> you'll be part of the group. <laughs> That's right. So the second thing is that, uh, well, uh, yes, uh, I'm, many of you actually uh, uh, know me as through JPAS, because uh, the IA is, uh, is a cornerstone, it's one of the founding institutions of JPAS. And, um, and I am a science director there, uh, but we just had a meeting last week and you know, I'm sure you know a lot and heard a lot about JPAS. So I thought of doing a talk on something else, uh, some work that I've been doing for quite a while and that it has a, a, a possibility of, and we hope to enhance in the JPAS and JNAP collaboration as well. But it's something a little bit different which has to do with uh, studying this uh, early formed systems, the generally called fossil groups, or originally called fossil groups. And uh, for a long time I had been um, you know, proposing getting some data, building up data from different institutions, from different uh, instruments uh, in X-rays with Chandra, with XMM, uh, Hubble uh, in optical and some spectroscopic information as well with uh, Gemini and trying to refine find a sample of the systems that was actually, I call them bona fide uh, because they, they seem to have all the weird properties that 
fossil groups uh, were supposed to have. Well, originally they thought they had they had this uh, very bizarre properties. Um, and I'll explain why there are larger samples of fossil groups, but they are generally used, they, they were using very often just the magnitude gap between the first galaxy and the second galaxy. And I will argue a little bit, and this just not me, that this is not the, uh, the best way of finding the systems. And so um, people have been uh, going around and uh, the, we have, uh, now I, I gave it a name, mixed eggs, multi-wavelengths, ICL and X-ray detection of early galaxy groups. And you really might be right. Uh, it's still a pending approval, the name that I gave them. <laughs> Nobody was against it. <laughs> Which involves a bunch of people from a bunch of uh, different institutions, uh, very good, the OAN and uh, the IAA as well. Okay, so. Oh. So, um, the, I'm talking about this in part. I returned to this a few years ago because there was a lot of, there was a big change. I think there were two changes there. One was a particular unexpected one, which was a work that has been, you know, the, the Yoli uh, and myself have been developing since she went to Brazil, which was the, the study of the ICL. And this actually sh uh, shone a light in the FGs that was uh, very welcome and very interesting. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, about the, the cycles uh, that uh, uh, you only let the work, and I'm sure that you've heard talks about this before. I'm not going to enter into too much details, but I'm just going to briefly mention. Uh, and our application for this to the clash sample, which we found, and this was very unexpected, uh, and amazingly surprising, that we found particular characteristics of the, well, it's not exactly the spectrum because we're using colors, Hubble colors, uh, particular features in the uh, ICL color distribution that could tell us in principle if the, the dynamical stage of clusters of galaxies, which is a notoriously difficult and necessary uh, problem has been open forever, including for cosmology. Uh, and this has a, this opened a, a, a very interesting window that so far remains open. And we are pushing this as far as we can to see how far can we go with this. Um, and like I said, there was so far, the sample is not large, you know, have maybe 15 total uh, systems, but so far it's 100%, right? Um, and I'm gonna mention a little bit of the, one of the latest challenge that um, is one of the clusters that uh, Yoli has been doing high Z, uh, testing high Z clusters to see how it works over time. And from time to time, you have a challenge. Is this actually breaking the, the finger, merging fingerprint or not? So I'll discuss a little bit about this. <clears throat> And then the application of this to the fossil groups, to this sample that uh, we raised um, using the ICL spectroscopy in X-ray spectroscopy in optics. And the, the main paper, the pilot paper for this, which, and, and this is a pretty interesting, uh, and was actually surprising to me <clears throat> that there was this whole discussion about fossil groups being old or not being old, because originally they thought to be old by their properties. That one of the characteristics of fossil groups, they have a, a big, a huge galaxy, a BCG in the center, and a complete paucity of bright galaxies around them, so, such that the rank difference, the rank one, two difference in magnitude is two. Even though this number is a little arbitrary, it means that there is a lack of bright galaxies in the center. Originally, they were thought to be galaxies. You know, they called OLAG, over luminous uh, elliptical galaxies. Now they have uh, X rays around, and there's only one galaxy. And OLAG, not surprising, was described by Alexei Vyru. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and then they end up finding galaxies all the way around it, uh, you know, far away. And they thought this, this is obviously not a galaxy, it, it's a group. And it's not really a group because some have temperatures and masses comparable to clusters of galaxies. Okay. So, um, the, and I'm going to go back about this, but one of the main contradictions with them is that they, they don't have cool cores or they have very poorly developed cool cores that you find in clusters normally. Um, and relaxed systems tend to have cool cores. A cool core for those for those that know, who are not accustomed to the X-rays, when you look at a cluster in X-rays, uh, the gas that permeates the galaxy, that we call them intracluster medium, even though this term needs to be revised, now the ICL is also part of the intercluster medium, but this is a very hot plasma with temperatures on the order of 10, tens to hundreds of millions of degrees. Okay, so the main emission there, they're fully ionized, almost fully ionized. The main emission there 
is through Grimm's trial, uh, and it comes in X-rays. So you see an image of a cluster uh, in X-rays, you see this blob there. Um, so the issue is that Grimm's trial is proportional. The emission of a Grimm's trial is a function of the density of the gas squared and a weak function of the temperature, okay? Uh, so in the center, central parts of the clusters of galaxies, the density is very high, is higher, so the emission is very strong, it's brighter in the center. So it, it, it lo loses energy a lot, very fast, and it cools off. As it cools down the gas, P is NKT, right? The, there's a pressure gradient, the pressure drops and you have a, a pressure gradient that will bring material from the outside in, which will increase the density more, and will emit more, and will cool more. Okay, so if, if you let this go, eventually people thought it would go to a cooling catastrophe. catastrophe. Right, but it doesn't because the AGM there gets active and starts hitting the gas through jets and other ways. So the, 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 this, which used to be called cooling flow stops at about a third of the average temperature of the cluster. So the thing is that if you leave a cluster there, eventually it would develop this cooling descent. The systems are supposed to be very old because they thought originally that all these galaxies that were around the BCG were equal, but by dynamical friction, you know, you start uh, slowing them down and uh, then have uh, tighter interactions that will, you know, destroy them. Uh, and so they were very old. That's what they call fossil groups. And, but they didn't have cool, cool cars, which is a main contradiction. Okay, so, um, uh, so many people, including myself, thought, you know, oh, this is <clears throat> nonsense. After this work, we conclude that, wow, they are actually old. <laughs> because of the introduction of the ICL. And we are gonna get there. So, uh, and I'm gonna show some preliminary results of some other fossil groups from our sample there. And uh, some of the hypotheses that we have now for solving this uh, presence of hot cores in fossil groups, uh, comparing with data from the Suzaku, it's another cell X-ray satellite. It has a pretty good spectral resolution. Uh, and uh, this work is led by Rebecca Battaglia, which is my Previous grad student, she just finished and is going to say a uh, in January. And some applications uh, of to JPAS and Juno. So this is the people basically so far. Actually, there's one person that's missing here that came on board a couple of months ago, which is um, Francois Mirnier as well, which is a great uh, uh, person to add in because he knows how to do deal with RGS, which is a very complicated spectrometer in, uh, uh, in XML. Okay. So what about the ICL? And I don't know, if you've heard this before, just tell me, keep moving. And by the way, if you wanna interrupt me, that's okay too, I mean, um, So like I mentioned before, uh, Yoli, when she finished here the, the PhD with Chichu, she, uh, they developed this uh, uh, championship polynomial fitting uh, tool that was amazingly good. And when she uh, went to work with me, we decided to invert this. And think, what about getting the, the, the galaxies? Any galaxy can be modeled by the chefs very easily. And I'm sure that uh, you have seen this before and you can take it out. So why don't we actually forget about the galaxies and look at the, the, uh, the ICL? And so we start trying to develop this, this thing. Um, and um, the first one, uh, you really let this work uh, amazingly. It's, uh, it's not a trivial, uh, thing the, uh, to do at all. And of course, the choice of clusters was, uh, that we decided to start with was perhaps not the best cluster, but well, who knows? It's, it's the Pandora cluster, a Bell 2744, which is a monster. And it's uh, one of the frontier field clusters. And if you, the data from GWST is actually public, it's incredible to take a look at this. And this is the cluster. It is a quadruple merging system. Actually, logically, it would be a double merging system, four clumps that simultaneously collided more or less perpendicular to each other. And you have all kinds of phenomenology. One is like that, the other one is like this. And in X-rays you see uh, basically a, a stream of gas this way, another one here, and you see some really interesting phenomenology. I don't wanna go into a lot of details in this. You see gas without dark matter, you see dark matter without gas, all kinds of stuff. So this was a pretty tough one to do, and it's good to be tough because if you can do for that, you can do for everything else, right? And that's what the, was the, the original uh, target was. And this is uh, what was published. This is in the uh, uh, EOLI MSL 2016. 
that's the original, you know, uh, is a very solid, robust uh, paper for the technique. Uh, and this is the original image, huddle image uh, at the red. And this is the after passing through the cycle, and this is the ICL distribution. So this was working fine. And then we decided to take a look. What about the universe part of the clash uh, group as well? So let's take a look at the clash clusters, right? So uh, start applying things over and over again. Um, and, uh, and that's the part that was surprising. Uh, here is basically you have this axis, the ICL fraction. And this is the frequency, the wavelength here. And uh, this cluster, this is the clusters, the three filters, um, uh, HRC filters. And the red ones, they are emerging systems. Uh, and the blue ones are supposed to be the relaxed systems. Although when I use relax, I don't fall into the trap of defining where a relaxed system is because I don't think anybody really knows. Um, you know, uh, but I mean, observationally speaking, it's very easy to say when a cluster is merging, not so easy when it's uh, dynamically undisturbed. But uh, several parameters for separating the two groups were used. And this I have, I have here present, presence of radio halos or radio relics. They're typical of merging clusters. Uh, concentration, generally the more concentrated, the more the less. Uh, active multi presence of multiple bright uh, cluster galaxies is general indication of uh, disturbance. X-ray symmetry, you can look at the image in X-ray, the power ratio, basic expansion of this and see the, the kind of substructure you can find there, centroid shift and so on. A lot of this came from Megan, uh, Megan's paper, Megan Donahue. And uh, so there were many indicators. And this is quite classified as a merging cluster. This is not, not so merging at least. And the, the surprising thing is that this is the error, this is the, the, the error here, that's the value for the two. Of course, we have only three points, but it's a lot of systems, right? And we can see that the relaxed clusters, they have more or less a flat color distribution. Yes. The ICL fraction is with respect to the open light in the system, or, with, or is it? Yes. Is it fraction, yeah. Is yes, totally, yeah. So, um, um, and, and thanks for that, because that can be confusing. It's not, it's not, you know, uh, not relative. right, right, yeah. So, um, and this has this, all of the, the, the you know, uh, of the merging systems were kind of here. And that was very unusual. Why are the, the you have this axis, in this case here is not rest frame yet, and I'll show you on rest frame in a second, but that's what we saw in the very beginning. So I decided to get this for historical reasons. <laughs> it's the more, the more emotional to see that. Right? Uh, so what's going on here? So when we plot this uh, in the rest frame, but only for the merging, those the only the merging clusters, um, you see that this, uh, they are kind of picking around somewhere between the 35, 45, you know, around this, this region. This is the redshift uh, of the systems. And again, I see a fraction, and there is this, this axis only for the merging clusters. And uh, here you have um, basically the average range for the peak emission of main sequence stars there, just for comparison. So which, what comparison, what would this be if there were a main sequence star? Right? So it's somewhere between um, A and F, um, some, somewhere about here. Yes? Okay. Um, so this definitely open. Uh, we, we're trying about physically how to do this. Raza, you may know this plot um, since it's yours. Um, and um, uh, we came up with the, you know, after Scratcher has a long time with an idea that, you know, since there is this gradient of, uh, you know, age and distance for galaxies, it's from Khalifa, um, you know, you, if you start by just tidal, um, tidal the dynamic friction, tidal destruction, right? Tidal interactions are removing uh, uh, stars from the outskirts of galaxies. You, I mean, if there is a gradient, uh, of particular stars in galaxies in general. So you, you, you may tend to start getting more stars at a particular time first. Okay, so if there is a merge and the merge enhances the ICL production, removing the stars, and there is an average gradient of, uh, 
of particular types of stars in, in, in the radio with galaxies, you may just throw those stars up there first. Okay. Of course, there are many caveats here, and it would be interesting to uh, explore this a little bit more because Khalifa, I think those are all field galaxies, but they're not cluster galaxies. And we are talking about clusters of galaxies. So it's not clear exactly how this distribution would actually be if galaxies were in a cluster for a particular amount of time, and then the clusters, the two clusters collide. Uh, we don't know. But that sounded like a nice uh, narrative for this particular process. And since the stars here at the end, they are more towards the, you know, you go from G, the average, and you end up with AF, this would be more or less the peak emission that we could be seeing in the ICM. So you're taking this, this, uh, this, a lot of this stellar population, you're throwing them out there. They are suddenly becoming they're brighter because they live about 40 giga years, 5 giga years. You take them at say, half age, uh, 2 giga years. So they live for 2 giga years. They produce the, this uh, excess that we call later by the blue ICL excess. And then after a few, about 100 giga years, they start e either becoming you know, white dwarfs or, uh, or becoming some red dim galaxy somewhere else. And you return back to what we thought would be a, the relaxed system until the next merger comes in and, and so on. So that is the, um, the narrative that I've been uh, so far thinking about. And, um, and of course, we, we kept finding up more and more systems every time we find one that is interesting, we uh, check it out. And uh, Yuri has been dealing with um, um, some of, I think is the relics, this, this part of the relics is uh, groups, right? But whereas cl clusters have some more filters on the very red, and on the very red, they, they tend to be, to go up as one probably would expect. If you think a little bit, probably all the stars, they become rather they, they keep accumulating the clusters there, even though they are not uh, very bright. And, and one of our hopes is that perhaps this is gonna be great to do scaling relations with respect to the mass of the cluster. We actually know that component in, in the red. Um, and this is just an example, one of them that was uh, particular, particularly mysterious and intriguing, and now I have been concerned about it, is this uh, software telescope 015. And you have this two one, there's another one from the Atacama uh, telescope, uh, 0102, those are the black ones. And you can see the black ones, they go up as well, when you have a blue axis. However, those are clusters that are shift one, or at least this one is one, this one I don't remember, or something close to that. Uh, and it, it keeps going up, and, but the bluer part, and this is pretty farther than the other ones I've been seeing, uh, they have a blue component a little higher. It has not declined yet. Eventually, probably, uh, they, they'll lose this part here. Um, and the problem with this is that some other people said the SPT0615 was an incredible example of very far away cluster that was built. So that's what uh, got us uh, curious. And this is uh, one of the initial uh, papers for this cluster. Um, and this is Monique Arnaud and I'll, they got the Planck there. It has a different Planck name uh, and the, the SPT name. And um, this is the system in seen by Planck. This is the X-ray seen by XMM. And that's a, a surface plotting prof profile. And so she, there's a paraphrasing here kind of, uh, this system, possible that this is a cool core object is Z1. Such objects are expected to be rare um, and no cluster at this redshift has uh, yet been found to contain a result central temperature drop that could confirm the presence of a cool core. And this one, there was a claim for a cool core of this system very far, very far away. Rational, okay. Um, yeah. So this is uh, 2017, many years later. This is an uh, observation with Chandra for the same system. They got 200 kiloseconds of, of the system there. And among uh, many five other uh, systems, they're high redshift, they are, they, you know, they are the, uh, SZ clusters. Um, and this is the only one that was observed with Chandra that was with XMM for the simple reason that Chandra had better data uh, than XMM for this particular cluster. And this is, was uh, Bartolucci et al. 2017, and this is a deep projected temperature profile of the system. And keep in mind, this is R500, which is about um, 
uh, about the megaparsec for this system. It's a pretty hot system, 10, 11 kV. And uh, you see this nice, well-behaved, the cool core, uh, relaxed. That looks like there's a cool core, looks like it's relaxed. Um, and there's a many um, mentions of this. He used this and he, uh, he also used, uh, stressed a lot the, the centroid shift. So how far the X-ray center is from the, you know, the, the BCG as defined by, and that's not real centroid shift. If you go to real centroid shift, and I did, it's actually bigger. And there are two X-ray centers, uh, X-ray peaks. But what they do is to get the uh, average uh, you know, circular aperture, and they don't go to the actual center. They just extrapolate it, okay? And so this is the only one. And again, in this business, it's kind of funny how people try to separate merging from non-merging. They use some parameter, in this case, centroid shift. And somebody, in this case, was Pratt, a uh, long time ago, said, well, we can divide more or less our sample if we can we assume that one, bigger than one is not relaxed and smaller than one is relaxed. And then the next person comes in and assume that that is an actual number and not something that was conveniently used to more or less separate two possible populations. Um, Pratt himself, he says very clear, you know, this is, you, know, you look and you can more or less here. And the next one came, oh no, one. Um, and so this is the system, right? So measure with Chandra, uh, it's below one, uh, you know, uh, it's actually borderline. And with XMM, it, it is uh, below one. Keep in mind XMM has a way significantly worse uh, spatial resolution than Chandra. And so they conclude this, okay? So it must be relaxed. So because of this paradox, I decided to take a look at this in the last uh, couple of months, uh, or three. Um, and um, so I look at the Chandra, I got the same observations about Kaluchi, actually. And this is the system, okay? Uh, the first thing that you notice here is that it's definitely not circularly symmetric. It is highly elongated towards this direction here. And if you look at uh, this in 2018, paper, the, the lensing, this is the system and optical, this is the critical lensing curves right here. It is the same angle, okay, about that. It is as if the cluster had, was being squished like that. But that's not all. Uh, you see significant uh, substructures right here. There's an axis emission right here. And there is also this whole region, this, this uh, axis it has more emission than one. So there's already there something uh, weird for, uh, for a relaxed cluster. So I'm gonna be very brief about this because I don't wanna enter too many details for this part because it's not the most important one. But I basically did uh, the same thing that I'm doing this, the same thing with the same radii that Batalucci was doing in that plot over there in red, except that I don't see anywhere a table where I had the values. So I had to get a ruler and do, you know, like O times, measure the radius, and I think it was pretty close. Um, and um, the deprojected value is the green black one, right? right? The, the red is a projected one, and the gray is a projected two. The red is basically these two regions stacked together. I use, like he did, centrally concentric circuli uh, all the way there. And this is one background I use, this is another background. <clears throat> but this is a, a detail. Um, and so here, there is definitely the temperature seems to be cooler, okay? Uh, but before you get here, it's not a smooth decline. There is a, a ring, uh, the second ring there, which is, I mean, the second, if I bend these two together, uh, there is about here, there is this uh, excess temperature that if you deproject gets to really high temperatures over 14, 15 kV, something significant. Um, and I was puzzled why we're getting such a scooping results and the rest, we are okay. I don't know, and I really don't know. If it's the technique for deprojection, I, I use a very ba basic deprojection technique, which is just piling up models all the way. They call the onion onion ring uh, method, right? And the only difference is that I use local background and here's some kind of model background that I have no access to. And also you notice an increase in abundance uh, here in Italisti from the outside in, okay? Um, and so this uh, actually suggests that you may have actually something cooler in the center, but not necessarily this is a relaxed cluster with a group four, right? It could be something else. Uh, this, this two backgrounds I used was to try to get a better version of the last bin, 
Okay, because there could be some contamination from this background being too close to this one here. And there was actually, because with the black one, everything is corrected. So the only one that changes is the very last bit. Um, okay, so let's keep going. So I, I um, kind of reviewed uh, an old uh, adaptive smoothing code uh, for x-rays uh, to see if I could get some more information about this. And, and this is adaptive smoothing. So it goes to a region, get a circle, see how many photons I want there. Uh, and then if it's not enough, it grows the circle, keeps doing that. If it is, it is enough, it stays with whatever is inside. And I could get uh, an interesting uh, uh, map. This is a, is, is packed all together here. So it's maybe a little confusing. So this is the temperature map. Okay, blue is you know, 10 kV or less. And the more it gets to yellow is 16, 17, white is uh, super hot. Um, those are the black here is the same contours I showed you before, the X-ray emission. And this contours in green are the regions that I consider to be uh, significant. Okay, this uh, has an error, basically the delta temperature by temperature, but inside this green thing here is about 15%. So the temperature have an error of 15%. Um, here, we are talking about um, 25%, yeah? 25%. If you go here, it, it, it's not, you don't believe anymore. Because temperatures are like 50% or 100% uh, errors. So you don't know anymore. You don't have enough counts. It's nothing you can do. However, in this inner region here, you can see a lot of stuff, right? This region is 15% temperature difference. So you can see the cooler region here. And not just here, you see cool region here. All along this, uh, this axis, you see the school, the school blobs. And you see this red blob here on this side. That if you do, and the white circles are the radially circular symmetric distribution that we showed before. And we, myself and Matalucci have a, a big difference around this ring here, where there is this hot spot that um, I don't think, I don't know why this was missed, but with this map, you can see that the problem is about here. So this region cannot say, Anything, but you can see there's an excess emission here, which is cooler. Um, and uh, this is actually more or less marginally significant as well. There's more structure here. This, this arm is actually hot as well. So putting it all together, this blob here that I'm finding with high temperatures is significant also coincides with another BCG or a pair of BCGs. They're actually coming, uh, same redshift, very similar redshift. They may be coming 500 kilometers per second or something like this. I would say it's coming towards this direction, like here. And this is where the, the main BCG is with a bunch of lensing stuff and so on. And so I think that uh, pretty much um, uh, settles the case that this is not a relaxed cluster. Something is happening there. There's at least one margin coming right now, probably two because this tail, hot tail here that we saw is probably to a margin as well. So again, the ICL cycle, works. So it's not buzzing. So about, about, about um, uh, fossil groups, again, coming back, some of it already mentioned to you, why are they interested? And right now they are more interesting because people got more data about it. Uh, they have very large BCGs. The AGNs are very inactive in, uh, in fossil groups. They have a paucity, lack of bright galaxies under half the viewer radius. They have relatively large masses. The masses are not anomalous. Uh, anomalous. But the masses correspond to the glass dispersion. Okay, they are high. <coughs> There's a lot of them, but they are still physically compatible with one single gravitational potential. Uh, they don't have a lot of substructure, if there's any. They have high concentrations. And it's, initially it was just C200, you know, uh, people using cosmology, with a wash where C200 is basically the, the, the radius divided by. Um, the R200, right? Uh, and um, by the core. And so if they are very high, and but it's not just the C200, you have X ray concentration as well. You get surface brightness from some region, 400 kiloparsecs, the same thing, the other one is 40, and you get some concentration there. So they are concentrated. And high concentration cosmologically, there are some studies that show that uh, they correspond with earlier formation times. Okay. with earlier formation types. 
Um, and they often lack cool cores or have small cool cores, not what you expect from a real life system. And uh, some of them, as I'm showing you, uh, they have hot cores. They have very high central metallicity, which is typical of cool core clusters. Okay, clusters that, that don't emerge, they don't have high central high metallicity. Um, so they seem to be an uh, uh, older system. So there were many selections we mentioned before about using the, the magnitude gaps. Uh, there's a lot of things here to read, and that's why um, magnitude gaps alone, they're not very good, okay? It's not a necessary condition for the system to be, especially because the magnitude gap of a, a system is highly transitory. Uh, so uh, the, the, if you do a, a sample based only on this, uh, th there'll be a very lack, very small, uh, purity on the sample. There'll be a lot of noise. It's going to be very difficult to get properties that are exclusively for, from these particular systems. Um, there are some different phenomena that can change this and follow up new galaxies may change the magnitude gap. Um, you know, uh, the opposite happens when galaxies merge with the BCG. Just the orbital motion of member galaxies will produce a variance in gap that can be up to two magnitudes. Okay, just the orbital motion. You look at them and project, say, oh, that's a magnitude gap. Oh, and that's a fossil. But that's not true. Uh, so one of the, the simulations that were interesting, Lee and Chen recently did a, a simulation of fossil systems, cosmological simulation and studied them. They were a little bit less massive than the ones that I'm showing you, uh, but uh, they also showed that um, uh, selection based on magnitude gaps is has very low levels of purity. However, magnitude gaps are cheaper, right? You just need to look at it and then they, other things like measuring concentration parameters or getting the, the, you know, the X-ray uh, concentration, things like this, they require multiple observations for your sample. And so uh, it's clear why people choose that. Uh, so we built this sample um, that we started with the max BCG cluster catalog, and then we put the field uh, you know, uh, on top of the magnitude gap criteria, low richness, high low mass systems, um, we followed up with Chandra snapshots, a lot of them, to see if they have uh, cool cores or not, have, look like they have or not. Uh, later it was confirmed with the XMM data, and we end up with the sample that I mentioned to you in the beginning. This is just a page that shows where we are with respect to the ones that have data from everything, like uh, XMM, Chandra, HST, Gemini, Suzaku, and whatever else we need. Um, and some they're missing, and some here that we have started looking at recently. So we got approved uh, this last round for Chandra for this uh, FP, what we call FP here is fossil group projection, because we like to see what happens to the system, the properties of the systems just before they become a fossil group. So the, the last galaxies merging with the BCG are the properties the same. And this is something that has not been very studied. You know, it was Lucas Johnson. Uh, did a selection for this uh, based on lensing because they tend since they are concentrated, they can find more lensing on on them. Um, and okay, so I'm going to show you very fast, uh, very briefly, the results for uh, the pilot study that we sent um, this year. It's published this year, and this is RxJ for short. I'm going to call them 1007. This is the image. Those are the two. This is the blue. Uh, that's the the Green, the 0606435 images of the systems, the, the fossil group, and this is the ICL as measured by cycle. One thing that is interesting, and I was talking to you a couple of days ago, is that now that I, I've seen some of the ICL from JWST in this meeting in Terrell, um, and they see some things that are really bizarre. Uh, they have some uh, so, uh, bright, surface brightness discontinuities in the optical, in the ICL, which is kind of weird because it's stars, right? It's not gas. And I was wondering if we actually, this is actually we're detecting this uh, sharp edges. And sometimes you find things like holes there, rings around. And the Chema was mentioned that this probably has to do with this flash uh, back radius that people find in clusters. N nobody knows. This is just fresh data. Um, so like, like I mentioned, I talked a little bit about the, the code before. That's an X-ray view of it. That's an XMM. View. Uh, that's half R500, and that's the, the contours. And I'm going to skip for the 
the results. So the temperature you see in the outskirts, this XMM drive temperature, except for the red uh, bin here, which is Chandra snapshot measurements. You see the temperature goes from you know, 1.5 to 3 keV in the center. That's 30 million degrees. And again, the abundance goes basically from the usual for clusters, you know, 0.2, something like that. And when it gets close to the center, it has this very strong peak. It goes to super solar values. Um, those are the actual values for that. And so um, put in there in the plot that I just showed you before, I want you to focus here only on the black squares. Okay, these two. Those are the merging clusters here. Those are the blue, the relaxed clusters. Forget about the green. We don't need to talk about the green now. Um, and uh, the black is the photo group, the ICL fraction that you have there. Not just, it does not show an excess there. It looks like it has a decline. It has like an anti axis okay? It looks like the red uh, part of it is going up and the, the blue part is going down, which is kind of what you expect if you just let the system be there forever. Like the, the blue, since this normalized by the total light, that includes the blue, right? The light of the galaxies there. And they will be you know, either quenching or disappearing from time to time. And this is gonna start to make the blue uh, ICL fraction to go down. And that's the second thing that was pretty amazing when we saw this plot for the first time. You say, they're really old, the systems, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, okay. So let me try to get this um, a little bit. Let me see if this can be understood because uh, we're trying to see how this works. If you have a fossil, we have a system that is merged. So you produce ICL, and we saw this before. When you merge the two systems, you get the ICL, especially in that particular blue axis, and you throw it out. Right? So knowing that merges, merges in, increase the ICL is something that has been thought for a long time. But if there is no merger, the system is stable, no interaction, you still have ICL being produced just by the orbital motions of the galaxies inside. Right? You still have a second. Uh, a second way of producing this. Now, uh, the logic here, we separate this process in two types. I call those which increase together uh, with the system's mass. The second method that I showed you does not, it's just ICL going up. The first one, when you got two clusters of mass and each one, they have also the ICL, you pile them up, you have the sum of the ICLs, the sum of the mass, plus the ICL is produced during the process of merging. So that's the increase in the ICL per mass ratio. The rest would not. If there was not no ICL, extra ICL produced in a merging system, and I got the two of them, I just merged them together. So you know the ICL and the mass would be growing at the same rate. You don't make any difference. There is a little. If you get a cluster that's relaxed, not merging, and producing ICL there, the mass stays the same. The ICL keeps the older is this ratio of ICL to mass should increase, right? So um, let me read this uh, with you. You have these two types. If two clusters formed at the same time, following different merging, tree, uh, uh, different merging trees and keeping similar average histories, so similar overall mass uh, distributions of the halos and subhalos, one would expect them to roughly have similar masses and ICL to mass ratio, or if you wish, you can call specific ICL. So it's, it's the amount of ICL per hydrogen, you know, per atom that you have there. At a, any particular epoch, uh, with a steady growth of the latter, even after all surrounding bound halos collapse into the final system. On the other hand, if one of these systems, which I call S1, formed earlier than the other one, uh, they have the same mass still, okay? The same conditions, everything is it's an idealized model. Uh, the other has to it would achieve its maximum final mass, swipe out all the halos around prior to S2 and start growing, growing the specific ICL only by this process, okay? That you don't grow the mass, the, the mass, only the, uh, the ICL type B. So at the moment S2, the moment at the time the S2 had its last merger, S1 would have the same mass, but a higher specific ICL, ICL, ICL or M or mass than S2, okay? So this could be a way perhaps of testing this. 
um, uh, NFGs would be S1. And you'd expect if this happened that they have been for a long time piling up ICL, keeping the same mass. So the ICL per mass should be higher. Uh, I don't know, after I, we thought about this, uh, I was not expecting to have such a huge, uh, I was expecting to see something like it's gonna be slightly higher than the other ones. And no, it was really huge. This is that system, okay? So this is, the, now is the ICL fraction divided by mass 500, okay? So this is the specific ICL. Uh, and this again, this is the filter, okay? The filters, the Hubble filters. Not the systems you've seen before, okay? All of them here, the more or less relaxed, the merging, they're all kind of here when you compare to the values that you find in the fossil. Okay, we're, we're talking a really, uh, this is the, the most relaxed cluster in the clash, I think is the 370. And uh, this is what the fossil group is. Okay, this was a, a pretty impressive result. Um, this actually, the, I'm not sure it's worth going through. This is a simulation from Lee and, and Chen. They're, they're basically, they came to a similar conclusion, although some things I, st I stroked through here because it's not clear that it fits with what we're observing. But um, they, they, what they saw in simulation is something similar. The normal group, you have the star forming galaxies appearing somewhere at uh, redshift two and three, da -da -da, and they keep increasing. Right here is the halo. And then at some point is equal zero, they start quenching the star formation here and gets a few, they get a few uh, galaxy coming here. The fossil group starts with a bigger halo, okay? A more concentrated and bigger halo and it, it, it accelerates this process, okay? And it forms earlier, and when I say form, I say, people say it's not a form before the cluster, but the universe has one particular age, that's it. Things are forming more or less at the same time. What, what, what we define by formation here is how much of the final mass do you get at a particular time, right? So generally people use 50%. The moment of formation of the, the system, the cluster is when it achieved, the halo achieved say 50% of the very final, when it has when it swept out everything that was around. So that's the, what people generally talk about formation. But so they would start with higher, higher halos and they would get this process happening faster. What I disagree here is that it suppresses star formation uh, within a few year radio. They say it's a you know, typical group, star formation galaxies in green begin to cluster with shift three. They continue to accrete matter and, uh, to form stars between one and two. Um, and then uh, until the gas hits the gas enough to quench stuff. You know, um, fossil groups also start forming a high Z, but they assemble with the halos earlier, our FGs come from more concentrated initial density fluctuations, leading to a more massive central progenitor, the redshift two, which quenches the formation early in the central halo. So far, so good, but I'm not sure about the second part here. And also quenches everything up there. And I'm gonna go back to this point at, at the end of the talk, because we have some evidence that maybe that's not the case. Um, the star formation of fossil groups tend to be consumed with central halo earlier than typical groups. And the end result is a group size halo, the same uh, halo mass, but a lower stellar mass. This is from the simulations. Uh, so, okay. One more group for you. Next one, RXJ0856. Actually, we have a third one, but we're still waiting for the, uh, some specs to actually pile, pile that up because the ICL is, the, the way that the ICL is measured is very dependent on the proper membership. Um, the membership of, of clusters, because this is very important for fossil groups because sometimes one bright galaxy you mix, the mist there uh, may alter everything right? because there's so few bright galaxies there. Um, the same one, same behavior, worse. The diamond is even worse than this one. It's more extreme, 0856. And if you look for the specific um, ICL fraction, this is where you are. Okay, even worse than the, the, the first one. Of course, I don't want to generalize from two to all of them, but it's going in that direction so far. Um, and uh, so the, the question about this that I'm going to uh, focus, is going to be the last part of the talk, uh, is uh, why, if the system is so old, you know, ICL shows this, they have, they're super old, have been for a long time, just growing ICL without 
increasing mass. Right? They don't have structure, they have um, you know, nice central abundance gradients peaked in the center. Where are the cool cores? You leave something there for a long time, you will develop cool core. Right? So this continues to be a puzzle. And um, so one, this is, those are the temperatures that I showed the 1007. This is the 086. Now that's 1410, another one that we have. They were almost finished with the, making sure that the ICL is correct before we, we publish this. Um, and the third one that I showed you was 856. And you can see here, there's also temperature. The outer bin is like 1.1 and the inner bin is 2.2. So it goes up for a factor of two. I don't have the plot here. So just this number that I want to show, but I want to show the plot. So perhaps the way to do this is to look at the balance ratios that I think is very popular in one of these galaxy evolution stars and so on. People love balance ratios. And next rays, you can also get the lines, get the balance ratios. And from this, it has been known for a long time that you can find out uh, what kind of type of supernovae or the group of supernovae actually was more predominant uh, where you're finding that particular measurement. Right, so uh, in, in a simple way, if you get uh, core collapse supernova, they generally produce way more alpha ratios, although not all of them, let's say oxygen or neon, so, than uh, supernova uh, type 1A. They produce way more of the iron type elements. So, and that's what um, uh, Rebecca uh, was doing, uh, her final uh, her thesis recently. And uh, what we find is that, and it's not that easy because the spectrum, we need more, of course, we need more data, but we still can take some conclusions from here. The fraction of iron mass that's produced by core collapse supernovae uh, for this system, 1007 is about 50% big error bars. Um, for um, this is 1410, in the center, it seems to grow to 60%, more or less. And 0856, it's, uh, you know, and even the center is over 19%, probably 20, 30%, but in this range here. Okay, she used two models. I can go back to this if you, you're curious about the models that were used. But what she did was to do a comparison of these systems to systems that we know they are, they are relaxed, but they are not fossil. Okay, to see what would you expect in contribution for supernova core collapse uh, in, this, in the center. And she used Suzaku data for a bunch of, of systems here, the 18 systems. Most of them, almost all of them are cool cores shown. Some others are mild cool cores and looked at the balance ratios. And uh, this is the plot for the inner regions and our regions. So Zaka doesn't have very good spatial resolution, but that's okay. Um, and you can notice that first of all, they are all well, most of them have an iron enhancement in the center. And if you look at the ratios here, you find a mild but significant trend in terms of how much more supernova type two I have, not the number, okay? Not the number, because uh, one spiral type 1A sends 10 times more iron than spiral type 2, but also sends uh, iron, okay? And iron is an iron. The question is, how much of the fraction of that particular metal came from this type and that type, okay? Um, so it was mild, very significant, but it's on the order of 17% in the center. And that's from this region here. The are is much better because we have a large sam sample in Suzaku uh, has great uh, spectral resolution. Um, so um, then knowing that, that we have a slightly higher fraction of core collapse supernova. And, and so core collapse supernova, they must have exploded more or less recently, right? Supposedly, maybe the chemistry of the gas was changed by the supernova, which means that they deposited energy from the explosions of all the supernova in the central parts of the, of the fossil. And that energy was enough to raise the temperature in the center, maybe. So that's what uh, the, the calculations were about this. We're talking here about 10 to the 59 parts more or less. Uh, and for each one of the systems, I'm not, of course the errors, and everybody's gonna say here, the error is really bad, but it doesn't really matter the precise error. What matters is that it is kind of, it seems to be sufficient. It's kind of in the ballpark that this particular explanation may be uh, what is causing the central heating in this uh, fossil. Okay. Um, so 
um, it is in the same order. So at the le at least we can say that what merges what merges because you'd have to have some kind of a galaxy with gas being eaten by the, the BCG, then you have fuel to start producing supernova, right? And then you warm up everything, change the chemistry of the gas, and then instead of getting the cool core, you get at least a longer period until the gas uh, eventually cools. So um, let me go before that. So the, the last part here, and, and this is just uh, where we are right now. There are many questions that we're testing and we're thinking about testing. Uh, one of them is uh, how, why, what's the frequency of wet mergers? Um, that are, were they higher near the, the formation of the FG? Was it like the last merging of the two galaxies? Was, it had to be a, a spiral galaxy that merged and produced this thing? Or maybe there's a lot of small little gal galaxies that actually get to the, to the center. And if they do, why aren't they quenched? Right? You expect like uh, to have uh, galaxies, uh, gaseous galaxies to be more prominent in the outskirts of the systems and not near the BCG. Why, maybe if you remove all the other galaxies from around the BCG, they actually are not quenched. You know, those are open questions that are very interesting uh, to test. That's what I say here. Can positive galaxy in the center stop the quenching? There should be an accumulated to be flex as something that I have been trying to measure, I mean, propose to measure, um, because part of the stars, they, from the, the by the blue axis, part of them are gonna become white dwarfs. Planetary, planetary area with white dwarfs. So they're gonna be forever there. And they're gonna have a, a peak that is in the UV. And maybe there will be a UV axis. Uh, that could actually give us material enough to know how many of them are there, okay? Uh, we have a deficit of UV satellites now. So I've been using some of the old ones. So, um, so yes, this is very important. And this is what I, uh, I wanna go to the, eventually, we got to Jake Baskin be very important for this, is that the ICL marker, this fingerprint of merger, is perhaps uh, the most clean, the most powerful way of telling the dynamics of clusters exclusively from optical data, okay? Um, and this is perfect for surveys that depend on optical data. Uh, to, you, know, you analyze a system of clusters of JPEGs and people do go through a lot of trouble to try to remove the merging systems out of there. They take the core out. They do all kinds of stuff, get specific rings and so on and so on and so on. If you already know by the optical that these systems are merging, you just remove them. And especially because you're gonna get hundreds of thousands uh, uh, of clusters. So you can sacrifice a little bit of the number to get a more pure set for cosmology. Okay. So this may be, for now, we are still, this is still the beginning. We have you know, less than 20 systems, but we're increasing uh, fast. But this could, I would not be surprised that this could be like a, uh, great clean merging um, indicator. Um, so like I mentioned before, ICL at very red frequency could be a very good mass, max proxy because have the, all the accumulated stars that live forever as well, they'll be there. Um, we are trying to see, and we have already some of the data, uh, if this also applies for FG, for the progenitors of fossil. And in, in more concrete terms, we, we thought about doing for the mini JPS, but the problem with mini JPS was that the background, you know, uh, has been the super background correction, made it such that no matter what we got, we will not believe it, right? So, uh, but this, the, the new guy, Mohammed, and I can't tell his family name. Ah, but he's a great guy, uh, he's very good. And he says, this can all be redone. The question is time for him to do now because JPS is gonna start in a couple of months, I mean, uh, transition completely to uh, full operation. Um, and so this is a question for some of you. Uh, any volunteers to do an evolutionary track of the FG BCGs? Because we have the data actually, we have actual spectrum it's from, from Germany and so on. Uh, that'll be great. So um, I think I, I, I talked too much. I'm gonna uh, stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Renato. And uh, the talk is open for questions.
Uh, yes, uh, maybe it's just a, a naive question, but regarding the problem with the cores and C groups, I was just wondering, um, I thought that I read that the, also the uh, intercluster light fraction, relative fraction to the mass of the cluster could be an indicator of the age. So mm -hmm. let's say that we have a heterogeneous sample where we have different ages, for instance. Do we expect the profile of the temperature to be in the, the central part really, really high and then see a cooling part, but in, in a, let's say, in a, a slower, uh, in a slower rate than for other groups or just always heating that central part? Right, that's a great question. I, I didn't show you all the temperature profiles of all things that people call fossil groups, including very nearby ones that we, for us, would not be very good to observe. Um, so there are two parts of the question. The, the first one is about age, and that's correct. If you see the, the ICL, and that's what I did the calculation for that particular cluster, 1007, I could say that this system became, well, it had last merging at five giga years ago. Okay, I, I could actually, uh, uh, co comparing it to the one that's right below, relaxed, I could have an idea of how much ICL per year, the injection rate of ICL, I would expect just from orbital motions of galaxies there. So, uh, but remember that I can only tell the age from the formation of possible of the, the system, but not for the whole thing. That's the age that I can do. But you have possible groups in, in, you expect the second part of the question, there are systems that have all the indications of fossil groups, but they do have cool cores. They're generally, uh, the ones that I've seen, generally they're closer. And you'd expect that eventually, if there's no more merging happening, the last one that heated up, th that gas is gonna cool off, right, eventually. It's just a delay. And you find some that have very tiny uh, cool cores, and there's one that is long, I think it's NGC 6842 or 6482, one of those, it's the closest to us. That has already a pretty well uh, developed cool core. And um, for that, for that example of the fossil group, and is there any kind of observation uh, research about enhanced star formation in the central galaxy or even aging activity or not? Yet? Which we again. I would love to share a slide. I don't know if I can. After you stop the broadcast, I'll show you. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even mine. It just came up with an interaction with uh, some other people, and you know. So, so um, wonderful talk. Uh, what's the prediction you have for the circulation history of the uh, fossil groups, uh, whatever we call EGGs, because they are groups, not clusters, right? So, uh -huh. so well, they are bigger than 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 BCGs, more. So they are BCGs. Smaller. Yeah. Uh, no, no, they're bigger. The fossil groups are they're generally, generally, not all of them, but they tend to be a little bigger. Some people think they're a little this here, although yeah, this. I mean, these are just even larger than the fossil groups, right? The, 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 the largest these are the non cluster, not the non and fossil groups. They are, in general, the, beast, the fossil groups are just. Yeah, that's the question. The question okay. was the prediction what is, on this topic. And that's what I'd like to see. If we have. I can see this in the gas, right? I should probably see this in the stars. So it would be interesting to see if you have a, I don't know exactly how this would work, some kind of secondary burst of top formation that matched, the, the, for example, the age that I'm calculating for the last merger in from, from that source. So the example you have, the fossil groups? Oh, for, so far we have in our system with Gemini data, Let's see here, because I can actually give the Gemini data before we actually do the X-rays, because we have data uh, in different, for example, if you look at here, this is, where's Gemini? Gemini is here. So for this one, we had Gemini, we, we got it. Uh, for, for the first, let's see, oops. Okay, it's about oh, there's one missing here. We have one, or uh, a little, perhaps, one, two, three, this is seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. There's 11, including the progenitors. Um, and what you see here, at GM, we have the, the Gemini data. Sometimes we're missing the X-rays. Uh, this one, 
Um, oh, this one, you know, Pepe. <laughs> I think we have it, uh, but it's in my gem, right? So I have to find a way of, of reducing this. Um, and for example, this one here, we had the uh, one, two, three, one from a previous work that we did. And we also have for Cheshire Cat, uh, it's a previous one uh, work that we did, Jimmy and, and myself. This is actually a very interesting uh, progenitor because it's the only case where you have two fossil groups merging that has been detected. It's a merging, it's, it's a fossil group progenitor, but each one of the systems, since they're kind of normal site, we could deproject the, the velocities. They're both fossil groups that are colliding. Yeah, well, yes, okay. Yeah, I know the work. And, and in the beginning, they were different, then they were not different. I think there were two or three papers for that. There are possibly uh, yeah, some different. Yeah, doing it right now, so it's uh, Okay, all right. So I think that's very interesting. The only care that we have there is that if the selection for a fossil group was made exclusively by magnitude drop. So you have other properties for the fossil group. Masses. Masses, they were low mass. They are not low masses, then they are expected to have higher masses. I mean, higher and on the highest masses. But there are, you don't have actions, so then. Right. Um, concentration, for example, lack of AGN activity, and then um, something like this. My, my fear is that I've seen many, many works, uh, and, and there are many samples of fossil, right? And uh, so people start finding something and then it becomes in the turbulent zone that there's no difference anymore. And my, my main concern in raising this sample is trying to avoid the noise. Uh, because if you dilute everything, and I'm sure there are many fossil groups, there are really fossil groups there, but the problem is purity right, with this. I, I don't know exactly uh, your particular work. I'm just talking about some work, the Santos, you know, that works in the past. I was reading, uh, and I was, you know, it, it was quite, I, it's difficult for me to actually um, believe some time the results that people decide to say, okay, we're gonna do Delta Mag one, two. Unless it doesn't work, we do Delta M Mag one, four, you know, and because the people wanna get a big sample, but, and they push a little bit here and there to do it, but um, uh, inadvertently they end up putting more noise in the in the sample, you know. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be very glad to. The way, you guys are doing. It. Yeah, it'll be very good. I just want to ask one short question, comment. <laughs> What's the kind of, of I mean, what level of, of uh, surface that brightness that you need to be able to to get the ICL? The ICL. Yeah. We have it, well, I guess uh, maybe early. You remember the number from the HST that we got? Well, the proof of the HST that uh, that um, eight box say a number that is about uh, twenty eight magnitudes per square second in the Arabic. At least that's what I had in my mind. So, did you have enough? I mean, did you have eighteen J bus to achieve those sorts? Uh, we're going to have to try. We may have to stack them, stack them. And the, the issue with stacking is again that um, you lose some information there. Um, but uh, we might in the beginning have to, to do stacking. Very interesting. Yes, I'm curious. Thank you, Renato, very, very spoken. About the, you mentioned that uh, uh, for some person. For some person, the, the alpha iron uh, ratio and across the uh, baby. So, is that thing of, that this change in relation to the uh, to the cooling down of the surface? Any, mo any model relating to something? Uh, so, you're talking about 
Yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, well, notice that uh, we have very, very, very large bins here. Very, okay, we we are photon you know, scra scraping everything that we can out of there. Um, so basically, everything here is in the center. It may not be the most central part, you know, but it, it's everything kind of in the core. We're talking about the hundred kiloparsecs here. This is the I, and then you have a table next. Huh? No, no, no. This is not exactly I. That this fraction. Right, but this is just the way. It could be the mass fraction. I could change this. It would be maybe just change a little bit. Remember up and down. I could calculate. It could be the cylinder. It doesn't matter. There's a. We just we assume. Uh, that there are only two, con or at least two main contributions to metals in the ICL. One is all kinds of supernova core collapse, which goes 1b, 1c, and supernova 2, da -da -da, hypernova, and the other one is uh, supernova 1a. Okay, so everything's going to be a linear combination of the production of these two systems. Uh, sometimes we, uh, the work that Rebecca did prior to that, which I can go into detail later. Uh, she was actually testing about 7,000 pairs of supernova models among themselves. Some are better, some are worse with respect to what we observe. Um, but sometimes you find that there, there might be a third type of supernova there, but as long as it's not important enough, uh, it doesn't really matter for this level of, of precision. Okay. Um, yeah, but here, what we're using here are many different elements. That we're, do, we're using, but in this case, it's not all of these, but it's oxygen, neon, magnesium, oxygen, neon, silicon, sulfur, at least. Okay. The other ones we could not, uh, the nickel to iron, for example, it's not that easy to know to get this because the fossil groups are hot, but they're not hot enough. The nickel, the main line of nickel is an AKV past the iron line. You know, for hot clusters, it's great to see. For cool, cooler systems, you don't see that. And then you have a little nickel in the L shell uh, at 1 kV mixed with the iron. It's difficult to de-blend that and get a clean abundance. So we, we, don't, we don't use those that we get uh, things that are too difficult to actually make. A, a, they're not correlate. They're not independent. So sulfur, silicon, uh, oxygen, and sometimes neon, they are. Uh, then we use those ratios to infer something that we call the iron mass fraction from supernova type one two. It could be any element. They're very high. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the regular clusters are actually not that much, right? This is the regular cool core clusters. We compare to those. So when you compare to the fossil groups, yeah, and that's the interesting thing, because they are higher. Questions? Okay. Well, why is the non-nuclear attached advantage measurement? So, I mean, I understand that there is something that is really very noisy because you are. It's. Is there any possibility to draw an analysis of the signals looking at the polygenetic function? Oh, people measured with the function of fossil groups. Well, they are basically. Uh, Lucas Johnson did. A few people did before. You can see this lack of. Of, of bright galaxies get, get into the center, except for the BCG. Uh, people, there are some different studies of fossil groups. And again, that depends on how you select fossil groups, right? Uh, uh, that have been studied in the long mass function. Yeah. Okay, but in, in, in any case, that will depend the value. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but the, the thing is that two is kind of arbitrary because it's, it's uh, I think the first fossil group was uh, Trevor Pondman. They found, yeah, uh, in I think '94. So yeah, and so uh, you put sometimes a number because it looks okay, and, and later it becomes written in stone. This number it uh, could be 1.8. Could be no, they're just uh, they have this clear uh, emptiness uh, of bright galaxies near the BCG. So uh, yeah, this is not something that. Uh, one should be completely attached to it. What I think is interesting is that the, the way that Lee, for example, and Chang did the simulations, their fossil groups, what they used was the ratio of mass, uh, of stellar mass to mass of the halo 
Let's see if I can read it here. I don't have. I think I don't think I have here. Uh, but okay, I have here, and it was a much better definition. And um, but of course, it's not um, easy to get here. So the ma stellar mass of the group divided by the but the mass of the halo uh, is half than um, the average, what you find for normal groups. So basically you have lack of stars there. And then they end up following the track of these fossil systems uh, up there. So this is a good one, how do you know the mass of the halo? So you have to have some kind of other observations to be able to get that. It's not cheap. But well, if you have some uh, lensing, Information. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. Fair lensing, at least wide scale lensing, you could get that, sure. But fossil groups, apparently, they're very close. That the my from my work on this, they seem to be really the most relaxed things you can get, and that's why my title is looking at, at the no, uh, at the past, right? When you look at the past and get information about the future, because in principle, they show us what every single system will become, given time enough. Yeah. Right. Are you aware of any work trying to extract fossil groups of inverted simulations in I know they're old ones, um, but they, um, this is the most recent that I saw, Lian Chen, Chen Chen, and they did a good job in that. Um, it depends again, how you define the fossil group, right? Because if you use only the, the gap, magnitude gap, uh, you have some works in the past. The simulations actually show that there's a correlation between magnitude gap with the age of the formation of the system. There's several of them, at least the two that I remember, they are very clear. But this is very different from what you observe, because you observe projections, right? Uh, so magnitude gap probably has to do with it. That's what I expect. But selecting a sample in the actual real sky uh, based only on that, then it's going to be more, more nice. Um, so, yeah. So, that part of the, the, the for me, that part of the, uh, so, but you mentioned that after you can have some sort of, uh, what do you call it? So for or speed production, physical taxes, instead of you, instead of all of them. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, if you have an, an old system, uh, well, I can work at all the S2 plus one. Yes. Uh, additional uh, uh, amount of ICL, you have uh, which, which way to decide that? You just need to be galaxies rotating around one another. That's all, right? You, you, you can just have dynamical friction, you slow it down. Okay, but by the there's a lot of. Uh, yes, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, I don't know at what point, because uh, eventually I'm assuming they would start stripping most of the stars they had already in the in the galaxies there. And if you don't have any, any more merging or galaxy incoming, eventually this rate that I that I estimate for, for that system would start to go down, uh, slow down. It would not be as fast as, uh, as, as initially. Um, but the rate was not that small. 
Now for that system, okay, that system is at point one. My estimation of the last merger was at point four in redshift. So during this time, uh, it was this ridiculous number by a factor of five, you know, more ICL than mass. Um, but keep in mind that more ICL than mass, if you're not growing mass, does not mean exactly the same, right? Because uh, if you get to, you could have a ton of mergers, way more, you grow ICL, but you didn't grow mass as well. So the, the, the specific ICL may not grow so fast. When you have just a system without merging, the specific ICL is the one that shoots up. But eventually you may not have any more stars to strip. Right? That was a, a really interesting simulation uh, to do. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but that's the thing. Uh, one of the characteristics, Mira, me, Mergali, or I forgot the name, Mirali, isn't one of the graphics there. The people have been looking at the aging activity in fossil groups, and it's generally none or tiny. Uh, they're not active which is consistent with having a hot core, right? So you have the characteristics, okay, the characteristics of, uh, all the characteristics of a cool core cluster, you know, the abundance shoots up, uh, everything, concentration, blah, blah, except the cool core. And uh, the agent activity is correlated directly with the, the inflow of material, right? They have the cooling. Thing. So it's not surprising, but they don't have, can say that they're important. And besides, this is also not because the um, uh, first thing that people would think is that AGMs may actually be hitting the core, since the AGMs, they do hit the cool core clusters uh, up to a level. Um, if the AGMs had hit before the system there, but this is different because clusters have AGM and some of them are amazingly powerful and they still have cool cores. It doesn't destroy them. And fossil groups that you have the hot core, you have a very underdeveloped, Cool cores. So, not clear what's the role of AGM there. Okay, we can close the talk here. All right. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Tell me when you stop stop recording. Yeah. Just a second.